Direct from Montreal, Canada, this is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, so much news happening this week. Uh, the M3 Festival is announced, and we have uh, Dave and Menachetti from uh, YNT to talk about that, their new documentary, and all kinds of other stuff. And then, of course, Motley Crue. Def Leppard and Poison, along with Joan Jett, have announced a stadium tour for 2020. And I know some people out there tried to get you to believe that it was a band called Last in Line, but no. Don't listen to the fake journalists. Listen to the real ones, the one of us, the, the ones that have actual sources and actually have news for you. If you want to know what's going on in rock, you can trust me, you can trust Eddie Trunk, you can trust a whole bunch of people, but... Somebody tried to sell you Last in Line as the opening band. Ugh. Just close your eyes and walk away. Uh, anyway, well, actually, don't close your eyes and walk away. You might hit something. That's that's not good. Anyway, <laughs> jokes aside, uh, I'm going to get right into this because uh, we do have Dave Manichetti of Y&T. So many great stories. Dave was just absolutely uh, delightful. Always delightful, by the way. Jill as well. Just, uh, just a great uh, couple and just a great band and just a, a great management team, the whole thing. And on the other side of that, uh, it is the one, the only Dizzy Reed of Guns and Roses. And of course, we always love having Dizzy on. It is, uh, it's a great interview because it's always give and take with Dizzy. You say, tell me about Guns and Roses. And he goes, right, sure. Let me get right on that. And, and it's just, I just, I love it. I love the give and take. It's, it's, uh, it's, well, I don't want to say it's a comedy routine, but it, but it's great. I love it. I, I, I love Dizzy. I love his wife. I love, I love the whole thing. I love Guns N' Roses. And of course, uh, since we recorded the interview, they have announced that they will be in Costa Rica on uh, March 18th. And who knows? Who knows? Maybe I will go. But uh, without further ado, here is the one, the only, from Y&T. Here is Dave Manichetti. We are speaking with Dave Manichetti from the band Y&T. The latest release is, of course, the On With The Show documentary. Just absolutely spectacular. And I will shout out to uh, to Eddie Trunk. He does a great job. I don't, I don't It's not hosting it. Uh, um, what do you call it? Voicing it, I guess. <laughs> right? Yeah, he's, he's right, right. He's the voiceover uh, on the documentary. But uh, their narrator. Narrator, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but as we say in Montreal, uh, Dave, uh, bonjour, bienvenue. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Yes. So, so let's talk. Uh, let, let's get into the uh, into the DVD and and the the release, and then we'll talk about the M3 appearance that was recently announced. But the last interview we did, which was at M3 2018, I guess. Uh, this documentary was sort of like a unicorn. We we heard about it, but we've never saw it. Uh, talk to me about finally getting it out and and finally putting sort of a a bow on the package, and and it's it's over. It's out. Fans can enjoy it. Right. I mean, it, it's been it's been a long haul, no question. Um, this this started out that we were going to turn it around. We thought. <laughs> well, I would say we, I should say the, uh, the filmmakers were going to turn it around in one year, according to what they thought. And of course, it, it took four times that length. So uh, people were getting antsy and, and some people that had given us money via Kickstarter to fund this project were, of course, uh, very disappointed. But uh, we kept trying to tell them, look, this is not us actually doing it, but you know, we know that they're doing a great job and it's, they just really underestimated all the work that was involved. They, they literally uh, had over a hundred, I think 115 people that they interviewed for the documentary. And some, some of those people they interviewed numerous times because things changed as, as the years were going by, such as members that previous members of the band that passed away and, and things like that, that happened over the course of the last four years. But uh, at the end of the day, <clears throat> what's the most important thing is, is that we always knew it was going to come out and it was just going to be, take as long as it needed to take for these guys to do the job, the, the, the best way that they could. And I think that they proved that they were indeed doing a great job all the way along. So um, we're happy it's out. Uh, people are going crazy on online buying it. Like it's it literally, you know, 
orders every couple of seconds online for the last two weeks. So it's, it's, it's doing its thing. And, and the main thing is, is that it looks good. It tells the story quite well without uh, embellishing, without making it sound better or worse than it, than it is. And so, you know, I think that's what people want to see. They want to see the, the truth of what went down and what has gone down since the very beginning of our career. And we're getting a lot of really fantastic reviews from people that don't need to, uh, you know, to be yes men to us. I mean, people that, that will absolutely tell us the truth. And, and so it's been fantastic. Yeah. And it's, I think it's important to show it sort of warts and all. I mean, that's, that's what makes it compelling. If if you clean that's it right. up, right. I mean, if you clean it up too much, it's like, oh, that's the sanitized version. And then, it, you, you know, you, you don't want that. Um, I want to ask you about one thing here. And I want to talk about branding real quick, because, of course, we know the band was yesterday and today. And in the, the documentary, you mentioned, well, you know, we noticed that it was sort of too many syllables and the fans were screaming Y&T. So let's go to Y&T. How, how important is it to have a name that is brandable and very easy to remember. Like, you, you know, when you listen to Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons talk about Kiss, they said, well, we wanted sort of a one-syllable name because people can remember it. How important was that change for you to go from the longer Yesterday and Today to by the third album, y and Well, it was always important to me. Even when uh, Leonard, our original drummer, had chosen the name Yesterday and Today, to, but, but that was back when we were doing cover tunes. I and mean, that was when we just put the band together uh, of me and him and a couple other guys that were playing with us. And, and we were just doing cover songs and, and a, a gig came up our, our very first show and, uh, and he named it off the top of his head. Well, not off the top of his head because he was actually listening to the Beatles yesterday and today album. And that's where he got it from because it was on, on his lap at the time because he couldn't think of a name. And, you know, we just thought, well, we'll just change it eventually. And not even thinking about, you know, are we going to create a band that's going to do original material and, and try to get a record deal? I mean, that was far out in our minds at that time. We were just doing cover song band to play locally, to make some money, to hopefully get to the point where we could uh, start our own band. So it was important to me from that standpoint. And then when we did actually record two records under the yesterday and the day moniker, when we changed labels and got with A&M, that was when I thought, okay, now is the time we, we've got to do something about this name. And by that time it was already, well, we had two records out already that under yesterday and today, and they were fairly popular in certain places. And we don't want to confuse the hell out of everybody. So why don't we just do what the fans do, which is chant Y and T when, the, when they want us to come back for an encore. So that just made it simple. And it, though it didn't necessarily mean anything in particular, it, it it's, it's a name. It's a, it's a place to, to hang your hat basically. And, and as years went on, of course, we realized that more people started doing stupid, ridiculous names for their bands because they just wanted, because they didn't care. Or, or it was just like, ah, what's in a name? You know, once they know the name associates with the music, that's all that matters. So there you have it. Yeah, so there you have it. And, and of course, now it's sort of in the, in the social media age. If you change a name something, it's pretty easy to sort of rebrand and just sort of get to the Twitter and the Instagram and just say, hey, by the way, the new album is called. And was it sort of a... Yeah. Was it sort of an earth shaker for you back then where, where for a little bit fans like in Japan or in France would go, man, c'est quoi ça? Who, who, who is this Y&T band? What happened? What happened? Like, was it right. confusing for the marketplace? Well, if it was, we didn't hear too much about it because at that time there wasn't the Internet. There wasn't social media. So everything that you heard was going to be from a phone call from your record company or from your manager. And, uh, and and what information they were getting from overseas or from other places probably was it, it was not filtering down quite well. So we just didn't know when we started touring all over the world and we started talking to people and some people in the press and, and some fans. There were a few that I remember way back when saying, yeah, I, I, I didn't realize yesterday and today, Y and T, I didn't make the connection at first, but eventually I did. So. I mean, it you know, it was a bit of transition for a few people, I would imagine. But uh, outside of that, I, I really don't know that it was that big of a confusing thing. Well, you survived. Uh, let me talk about some of the guests in here. You've got Don Dawkins, Dee Snyder, Sammy Hagar, uh, Eric Martin. 
Uh, talk to me about having those guys, and of course Eddie Trunk, who who uh, narrates it. Talk to me about having these people that stepped up and supported the band and decided, yeah, I'll, I'm going to get on camera and talk about this and be part of this documentary because, you know, I can imagine that Sammy Hagar's got a lot of things to do in life, and if I said, hey, come and sit down for a Mitch Lafon uh, documentary, he'd be like, yeah, sorry, I'm I'm busy. <laughs> right, so, so right. I thought, how, how important and how, well, yeah. how how does it make you feel that these guys are like, yeah, no, we we want to support these guys and and be part of this. Yeah, no, it's it, it was a good thing. Obviously, we were really happy that uh, certain artists had stepped up to the plate and said, yeah, I want to do it, um, and we didn't have to hassle them, you know, and keep on it or anything like that. And the the thing about the the people that are in this particular documentary is that. Um, they were all fans of the band or were associated with the band at some point doing something. I mean, even with Sammy Hager, Sammy uh, and, and, and yesterday and today, we used to play together all the time. And uh, we were both coming up at the same time. And uh, <clears throat> he used to hang out with us every once in a while. Sometimes he'd come down to our rehearsal studio, we'd jam he'd come out on stage and, and do an encore song with us or something like that. So We've had a lot of, you know, uh, exposure with 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 all of these guys, one way or another. We've toured with them, or they were fans of the band before they were in a band and got popular themselves. And so, you know, all of that for them meant that hey, I want to talk about my experience, about what I, you know, what I thought about YNT and yesterday and today when I first found out about it. And that's what's really cool. I mean, I I, I love the fact that some of these guys just came in and said, yeah, I want to do it. Come on down and film me or I'll do it myself and send it in. So that was a good thing. It really was. All right. So lot, let's talk music because all, <laughs> ultimately uh, we, we listen to bands for, for the music. Uh, Endangered Species comes out in 97, 13 years later, you know the story, Face Melter comes out. Next year is the 10th anniversary. Hopefully it'll include a 10th anniversary tour and then, of course, acoustic classics, which is sort of reimagining the old stuff. Where are we in terms of new music? And I'll, I'll, I'll add this. Does it matter? Is it important? I mean, you, you're out at M3. You're playing the shows. You're on the Monsters of Rock Cruise. Does it matter? Do you need new music? And do you want to get new music out? I think it matters in as much that it's great for the band members to continue to be creative and come up with new material and write together. I mean, for, from that standpoint, that's that's cool because then the four of us are playing an occasional couple of songs off of a new record that all four of us were involved with from, from the beginning to the end. Even if not necessarily all four of us wrote a particular song, it's just that we collaborated and, and we spent time in the studio and, and we made something. And, uh, and this is something that energizes anybody that plays live every year to have something different in the set that they can key into and go, Hey, this is something new. This is something we haven't played, you know, and, uh, and it energizes the band. And I think that it energizes the fans to some degree. And I say to some degree, because in the old days, <laughs> and I say old days, meaning when this style of music was th the important thing in, in the music industry at that time and, and teenagers and, and people in high school and and twenty year olds and so on and so forth. Those that was the crowd for that style of music. When that was happening, a new record was uber important. It, you know, for for you to keep going and 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 to hopefully uh, gain more attention and and become a bigger band, um, and and come out with you know more great songs. But um, nowadays, uh, when when the fan base is still there, but it's it, you know we, we're far from being important as far as billboard charts and radio play and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, it's, it's basically hip hop, you know, that's, that's, that's what's important that and pop music as, as it always has been. Um, so, you know, at this point, what do the fans want when we play live? They just want to, they want to hear the songs that, that they grew up with or that they found out about YNT, even if it was just six months ago and they want to hear those songs. Now, not that they wouldn't want to hear new songs. And, you know, when we released Face Melter, 
uh, we would play three or four songs in the set and we could get away with it because we play two hours or two hours and 15 minutes every night. So they're still going to get a lot of the songs that they expect to hear. But, uh, you know, it, it, it goes off. People loved the songs. It, it, it fit in nicely with our old stuff as well. So it, it, it works. And I think that the fans enjoy it. Is it super important? Is it, is it, I, we have to do it or, or we can't play anymore? No, definitely not. Uh, ask every one of the bands that have been playing for more than 20 or 30 years. And they'll tell you the same story. Most fans want to hear the old hits or, or the big songs, or they want to hear a couple of deep tracks that, you know, and that's what we've been doing. If we didn't have a new record, we go out and, and we go, Hey, let's play some deep tracks. Let's play some tracks that fans probably want it, would love to hear, but they're not thinking about it. Or maybe they are thinking about it. And we hear, you know, the requests every so often at the shows. And so that's almost like having new a record out again, because we're playing tracks that we haven't played before, or it's been so many years that it's like a new song too. So that, that helps to energize everybody. It does. And, and I think when you get to a festival like M3 and you will be at M3, uh, 2020, and I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, you can't sort of throw in a couple of new songs because you've only got 45 minutes or 60 minutes. And I think the fans going to a festival like that expect you know, the stuff from Earthshaker and Mean Streak and exactly. rock, you know, and, and so you're sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't. So, you know, um, yeah. And, and with something like that, I, what I've learned over the years, just me personally, what my own, you know, take on that is, is that when we play these short festival shows, no matter where it is, um, if we want to play something that we think is strong that we just now put back in the set that maybe the band never played or hasn't played in 20 years. I feel like we just need to make room for that in the set of, of a 45 minute show or a 60 minute show, because uh, sometimes it's showing a little something different that, of the band's uh, whole vibe, whether it's musicianship, that type of thing come, comes through on that particular song or just, a slightly different attitude uh, or, or tempo or something like that. So I think that that's good because sometimes, even though it's true that most people just want to hear the hits when you're, when, when they come to a festival show, sometimes if we play a festival like M3 more than a few times in a row or not even in a row, just a more than a few times, some fans will go, Hey man, they play the same songs every time, you know? So so I like to I like to mix it up no matter what, <laughs> and we got and lucky lucky for us we have a lot of songs so we can mix that up enough uh, you know to where people still know the tunes and and get away with something different each time. And and I have to say I I don't envy you because I I hear the fans all the time if if you and we'll use M three as an example you do the say whatever ten song set and you did it in twenty eighteen you do the same one they go oh they never changed the set they uh. But then if you right. play a song off a of face melter, they go, oh, they played new music. It's like, oh, come on. Like, like what do you want? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, yeah. uh, getting off of that well, first. Let me, yeah. yeah, let me just say one thing about <clears throat> new music as well. Uh, I've already said that I think it's important from, from the standpoint of, of the growth of the band. And I know that fans like to hear new music. Um, but I will say that every single time we talk to fans, at the shows or even interviews. Hey, when's your new record coming out? When's a new record coming out? And I remember Phil, our, our old bass player, uh, unfortunately passed away quite a few years ago now. Uh, he used to say the same thing. He used to say, uh, did you buy our last record? <laughs> and, I, and, and strangely enough, that usually stops somebody short a lot of times, you know, because now Face Melter had been out and we'd be starting to say stuff to, you know, start to say hi to the fans after the show or something like that. And they go, hey, man, when are you guys going to come out with a new record? And go, did you get Face Melter? <laughs> and it's like, if they go, uh, no, I, uh, no, I haven't, then, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well, wait a minute. How come you just keep asking for new music, but won't even buy it when we, when we come out with it? So that was his thing, you know. Phil used to go, I bet we could. We could uh, we could probably stop these these guys short because I think it's almost like that's the standard thing that they want to ask us. But do they really care? I don't know. <laughs> uh, by the way, I agree with you. 
uh, I, I have this conversation th- through my socials with fans. They'll say, hey, uh, whatever, Foreigner hasn't released a new album. And, and you go, well, did you buy the last one? Uh, oh, oh, they had a last one? Uh, all the time. <laughs> all the time, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But but yeah. speaking of this, and here, here, I was speaking to Wes Scantlin of Puddle of Mud. Uh, the Universal Fire destroyed all of the Puddle of Mud catalog. And I said, so what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, nothing. I mean, it's an accident. I mean, shit happens and say la vie. Uh, yep. uh, from what I've read online and what I've heard, you you don't necessarily have a say la vie kind of attitude towards it. it it's a little more, uh, talk to me about the, the universal fire from both just a business standpoint, but also a personal standpoint, because here are your demos, your heart and soul, your blood, sweat and tears. And it's just, it's just gone. And, and you yep. just, you, you, I mean, it's gone, gone is gone. There, there's no yep. magic button to ungone it. Um, yeah. so, so business wise, let's, let's go with business wise first and let's go to the personal sort of tragedy. Why? Well, like I'm assuming it's a tragedy, uh, but, but yeah. business wise, what does that mean for you? I mean, that, that means no box sets, no, or, or is there some kind of digital file somewhere where you can still do something or are you just sort of yeah. out of luck? No, we're not out of luck. And most of the artists that lost material are probably not out of luck. And I can't say for sure, because I don't know what every artist had in that particular warehouse that that caught fire. Uh, For us, it was all the original mastered copies of Earthshaker, Black Tiger, Mean Streak, and Rock We Trust, Down for the Count, and uh, and I think maybe even a couple of the Geffen records that we did, maybe Tim and Contagious, and Open Fire Live. So it's literally almost our entire catalog of original masters got destroyed. Now, the two-inch 24-track masters, the actual individual tracks on each little slice of tape, those tapes were not in that warehouse. So they're still there if anybody ever wanted to mix them again, you know, and do it. But, But the original mixed masters, the ones that they used, to make the original albums and the CDs, that is the stuff that's gone. The, the half-inch copies and the quarter-inch copies, analog tape. Now, there are backups on digital and some other weird media that, that's almost like a, a videotape kind of media thing. And, uh, and there may be some other backups of the masters that are around. But the original masters, of course, are gone. So there are options. You can always make, even if, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize this, but some companies don't even go through the hassle of getting the original masters or even copies of the masters from the, from the labels to release or re-release some, some tracks. They'll, they'll just take a DVD, I mean, a, a, a CD and rip it from that and, and maybe put some EQ on it and some compression and say, it's a remaster, you know, and it's, and it's far from what I would call a legitimate remastered, you know, release kind of thing. So some people do that too, but you can always mm. do that if you, if you have to. Well, um, yeah. and I'm just going to throw in my own little personal thing. It's when I hear fans talking about vinyl and the 180 gram and it's so much better. And it's like, you do realize that nine tenth of those is just like a CD transfer, right? I mean, you, you're, you're aware, yeah. and they're like, "What do you yeah. mean? No, no." It's like, yeah. So anyway, yeah. There's uh, something about yeah. There's something about the way you mix back in the day of vinyl and the way that you mix and in CD and streaming. It's quite different. It's uh, it, there's there's a different EQ that you put on things and. And pre-emphasis and, and a whole lot more compression and, and expansion and so on and so forth. And that kind of stuff does not do well when you press a vinyl record. So you have to almost do a separate EQ'd master for vinyl if you've been recording in the last 20 years. So that's just, you know, the, the, the bold, hard facts of it. So, and as a matter of fact, we have a vinyl release of our latest uh, six song acoustic record that week that we came out with and they tried to do the vinyl on the same master that we mastered for cd and the guy at the vinyl place that we knew said oh no no no, no. you can't do this this it, it, the, with the top end you know so 
so EQ'd and so on and so forth, it, it, it just plays havoc to, uh, to the cutting head. So you, you need to think differently when you're going to make things for vinyl as well. You need to do a separate mix just for vinyl. And that's, and that's, you know, and you don't always have to do that. I mean, people can get away with it and people can, you know, change things and re-EQ it and so on and so forth. But to get the best quality vinyl, you really should do it from the start when you master it. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, a lot of companies don't and a lot of whatever. Yeah. Um, I want to get back to the universal question in a second, but you did, of course, mention Acoustic Classic Volumes 1, which at M3 back in 2018 is one of the things we talked about, also being a vintner and, and, and the wines and stuff. But right. Volume 1 suggests a Volume 2. Yes, Are we getting a Volume 2? And, uh, that was an idea at the very last minute when we were naming the CD. <laughs> and, uh, and I think our bass player said that. He goes, man, we should call it Volume 1. And, and then, of course, we even said, oh, I guess that means that, you know, we could do this again because this was fun and, and we could come up with some really cool tracks. And so, yeah, I mean, that's that's the idea is that we could probably do another one and may do another one uh, somewhere down the road. It's, it wasn't going to happen right away. Uh, we'll we'll get to it eventually. OK, because you do have Unearth Volume 1 and Unearth Volume 2. You don't want to be breaking the streak now. You got to. <laughs> no, that's you gotta, right. You gotta, we got to have at least a volume two of something, right? Got, right. But so. uh, but, but it, it, uh, to get back to your thing about about the, the masters, yeah, and the, per, the the personal, because you wake up, right. you see this in the news, and you go, "Hey, wait a minute! This happened in two thousand eight, mother. F- Nobody told me." Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so, so and so. there therein lies the rub for me. Um, it it's just like you were saying that fellow from Puddle of Mud said. Well, it's say Levy. Okay, I can understand that if at the time that those masters were destroyed, along with all the amazing masters that were destroyed of of original artists that everybody knew the songs and and that record from way back when. I mean, there's so many of them; it's it's unbelievable. Uh, but if they would have just, you know, come to the the simple thing of being honest and telling everybody that. And even if they didn't literally individually contact anybody's contact information for whatever, you know, artist that they could have had, you know, uh, if they could have just even said it in the news, we're so very sorry that this happened. And, you know, it was it was an accident and there's not much we can do about it. It's what's gone is gone. And here's the list of the things that we know were in that warehouse and are no longer there. And here's what we've got. And please get in touch with us to let it to, to to let us go through it and tell you what we have left, or something like that. If they would have just been honest, but instead they they purposefully covered it up, and they told the the uh, the archive manager, the manager of the archives, to keep his mouth shut about it. And he was absolutely devastated by that, and it stressed him out for a decade plus, whatever it was. Because he didn't like the idea of of the fact that all of the stuff was gone and he couldn't tell anybody. It wasn't his fault. It was his directive or he would have been fired. Now, Universal got a huge claim from their insurance in, in the order of hundreds of millions of dollars, according to what I understand, because of the loss. Okay, now I'm not saying that they should necessarily turn around and give some of that to the artist, but they should have at least been open and honest about it and, and come, come forth with the absolute fact that I'm sorry this happened and this is what went down. Uh, because the fact of the matter is, is when we turn around to go, hey, now we want to uh, get the licensing to release another record of ours and we, we need the Half Inch Master, they're going to go, uh, 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 yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, luckily, the news got out some way and I didn't know, and we didn't know that, that our stuff was in that until the New York Times came out with an article about a week and a half after the main news got broken. And they said, here's the full list of artists that lost material. And that was the first time I saw it. Uh, I mean, certainly nobody from Universal ever contacted us. And, uh, and, and it wasn't out there in the ethers, except that it just, you know, that was where we found out about it. 
Yeah, and and yeah, sorry. So let me let me take up on this, and then and then we'll we'll wrap up. But uh, so I, I think when Wes of Puddle of Mud says, "Hey, it, it happens, say la vie," and it does, I, I don't think anybody's going to ascribe blame and say they torched it themselves. I mean, that, that that's ridiculous. Surely, right? Yeah, no, they would never. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Which is we all understand that 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 assertion or that kind of scenario is completely ridiculous. But when they do the insurance claim, and then keep everybody. That's when I, I don't want to say maybe we're dealing with criminality, or, but that's when it sort of goes, well, now, now you're just, now you're just fucking with people. Like that's not, that ain't, yeah. that ain't cool. Um, no, it's not. It's <laughs> not. And, and there is a uh, lawsuit that has been started. It's a class action lawsuit. And um, when, when Jill, my wife, who's the manager of the band had gotten in touch with some lawyers about this whole thing, they said, oh, there's one lawyer comp- there's one lawyer firm that is responsible for this whole project, and you should contact them. And so she did, and she said, we're adding your name to the class action. And she said, you know, and of course, you know, they, they are going to probably have some sort of uh, remuneration that they're going to have to come out with for some of these some of these uh, bands, I, I would imagine. But, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not waiting on any particular amount of money or the class action suit going through. I, I don't really care one way or the other, to be honest with you. It's more just like you son of, sons of bitches. Why didn't you, you know, we know why you didn't want to tell anybody because you were afraid to tell anyone because you were worried about lawsuits, you know, and it's just like, well, now it's going to come back at you, you know, twofold. And so it's, it's just an unfortunate situation. And, you know, you hate to say big brother, but Universal is the big brother of the music industry. I mean, that's there's no question about it. The fact that they own so many record companies' masters. I mean, it's not just Universal. It's Warner's and it's A&M and it's Geffen and it's, you know, London and so on and so forth. There's, there's, there's only a few companies that own all the masters of all the artists out there. So it's, it's, I mean, these guys are big time guys. And when they want, when we wanted to release, re-release our records years ago for, you know, remasters of Earthshaker, Black Tiger, Mean Streak, and Rock We Trust, we had to pay through the nose for the royalties to do that. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was expensive. It was, you know, we're, we're selling those CDs for 10 bucks. I mean, it cost us almost half that amount or more than half, actually, just to get the rights to release it before the mastering and and the uh, you know the, the replication and the artwork and anything else comes into play. So you know they the, these guys needed to be honest with people, and of course they decided to be sneaky. Yeah, they did. And and you mentioned remuneration. I, I, I'm I'm going to assume, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you had a chance to get a paycheck or your master's back, you would probably vote for the master's back. So it's not about the cash, but no, that's all that's left, unfortunately. It's not. It's not. And and again, I mean, I, I really don't care that much about it. It's more just that we get added from the standpoint of, yeah, we're pissed. <laughs> you know, it's so that kind of thing. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'm going to finish on, on M3, but I'll ask you this just real quick. Since the story came out in the New York Times, did you get a phone call? Did they did they say, "All right, you got us"? Hey, or is it just still like, "Oops, not a"? I mean, is there still no, a veil of no. secrecy? There's no call, no, no, nothing. No, there, I don't think at this point there's any veil of secrecy. In in as much as are we admitting that it happened? It's just that we're not going to contact anybody because these are masters that Universal probably own the rights to anyway. So it's their masters, so they could say, "Well, you don't own it anyway." You know, uh, it's it's ours, even though we own our own publishing and we certainly have everything else about those recordings. But, you know, that's that's how they could probably try to say we can get away with it. And we didn't need to tell anybody, because even if we did tell somebody, what are they going to do about it? You know, <laughs> and uh, it, it's just a it's just kind of an, an arrogant attitude is, is what it is. Now, we had to find out what was missing and what was left. And so in order to do that, we got a hold of the archive department 
and they were fantastic. And he said, please give me about a week because I'm swamped with all kinds of requests of other bands and, uh, you know, other artists asking me the same thing. But he was very thorough and he sent us a PDF of everything. And mainly he sent us an email with all of the things that got destroyed in the fire. And of course, you know, I'm looking at that going quarter inch and half inch uh, masters of all of all everything we've ever done that was released that was important. So I was like, yeah, well, there you have it. <laughs> wow, wow. Anyway, I'm just I'm just amazed that their lawyers didn't get a hold of them and say, listen, show some goodwill, contact everybody, you know, offer some apologies, make it look like you're anyway, whatever. Uh, but let, let, yeah. let's let's get yeah. off of that because we we spent too long sure. on this. Just quickly, uh, M3, we you've played it before. Uh, Eric Baker and his gang do a fantastic job. Uh, just quickly talk about the festival and and what do festivals like M3 mean for the scene? And then let us ride into the sunset and, and let's we'll call it a day. Sure. Well, for me, M3 is kind of a an American version of a European festival. And when I say that... I, I mean, there are lots of festivals around the U.S. Uh, there's there's some in Minnesota, in Hawaii, you know, all all over the place. There, there's different festivals, but very few of them have been consistent with the type of music and uh, that that they support. Uh, M3 is honest to God classic rock rock and roll. I mean, that's it. That just and that's all they do. They they don't do a blend of other other artists, and they don't have you know, a five day festival or something like that. Although they, they have made it into, I guess, a three day festival now, but, uh, but two and a half, it's all classic. Yeah. Two and a half. Right. It, it, it's all classic rock. So from that standpoint, it's, uh, it's a unique American festival. And, uh, and, and we're happy that they continue to do it. The fans are obviously happy because, Everybody, everywhere on the East Coast, when we're when we're touring every year, keeps saying, "Hey, you going to M3 this year? You're going to be at M3." You know, everybody seems to to make that a, a happening affair, and they're going to and they're going to either drive or fly there. So it's become this thing over the last ten years and uh, plus, I suppose. I don't know how long he's been doing it, but uh, and and we're happy to be involved in it from time to time. Yeah, and I think it's uh, it's 11 or 12. And listen, I've been twice and I've driven from Montreal. It's an 11-hour drive to that place, but I've done it. <laughs> this year I'm going to yep. go back, but I'm taking a flight. My buddy flew down last year. I think it was a 75-minute flight, so I'm down for that. But uh, sure. we will see you there, and uh, always a pleasure. You and Jill have always been exceptionally nice. And so as we say uh, up here in Montreal... Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Indeed. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Cheers. Here's Paul Stanley to tell you why he doesn't want to shake your hand. Some people might have a little rock and roll pneumonia. Ugh, not even cold gin will kill those germs. This is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. And a very big thank you to Dave and Manichetti, of course. Do check out the new documentary by the band On With The Show. And uh, speaking of with, uh, On With The Show, let us get over to a dizzy read of Guns N' Roses. The band has announced a Costa Rican date on March 18th. The first of many South American dates to come? I don't know. Stay tuned. We'll find out soon. And, of course, uh, we did talk about the uh, M3 Festival, the greatest time that you can have, well, without breaking any laws. So uh, go check out the M3 Festival in uh, Maryland. And on that, here is the one, the only, keyboardist extraordinaire, Dizzy Reed. We are speaking with uh, Guns N' Roses keyboardist uh, Dizzy Reed, Hookers and Blow. Of course, the band heads out on a, well, do we call it a tour? It's uh, three or four dates in, in December, right? Uh, what, what are we calling it, Dizzy? And as we say, uh, bonjour. How are you? Um, we're a, a few shows. We'll yeah. call it a few shows. Okay. So, and but how are you? Think, things are good? Uh, things are good, man. Um, just hanging out in California. We had a little bit of rain, but now it's nice and sunny, and I just got back from the golf course, and I'm going to go again tomorrow. Oh, yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds horrible. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's you're, terrible. A little rain, yeah. Okay, well, uh, come, come and hang out at minus 20 and see how, you're, how, how, you, how you hold up. Uh, you know, okay. I've been there. I've been there. I was actually in, in Winnipeg one time, or Saskatchewan. It was minus 40. I don't know if I told you that. Oh, God. And, uh, 
the cab driver told me that that's where Fahrenheit and Celsius meet at minus 40. Yeah, it does. And uh, yeah, you don't you don't you don't ever need to have that. But uh, let, let us talk uh, hookers and blow. And we'll talk a little bit about Frankie Benelli, too, because I know that you have been or the hookers and blow guys have been tracking stuff with Frankie for some kind of Led Zeppelin magic or some kind of what is that story that that's sort of been coming around? Um, well, you know, we we are hookers and below. We, we we are in the process of almost finished with uh, our first record, which is a uh, it's all cover songs. And um, we decided and Frankie wanted to be a part of that. And so, uh, you know, he is he's more Bonham than Bonham sometimes. And, and so we wanted to do some Zeppelin songs and they sound amazing. So that's you know that we're working on that right now. So talk to me about this album because if you go to the Golden Robot uh, website, it says new single coming at the end of November. But now we are of course in December, and then early 2020 uh, there will be an album. What's the schedule like? I know you have uh, talked about a single called Shaking. When are we getting that? When is that coming out? And then when do we get the entire album? Uh, well, Sh- Shaken, we wanted that to be the first single, and it should be out very soon. Um, and I apologize to anyone who did, uh, who has been looking for it, but we will get that out as soon as we can. Um, but that was, you know, it's it's a, a, a tribute to, you know, the, the late, great Eddie Money, who's one of our favorite artists. And uh, we wanted to just, you know, do him solid. And I think you know, we did a good job with it. And uh, so that's going to, that'll be out. That's the first single. And then the rest of the album should be out, should follow first part of next year now it, it is a covers album so was that sort of the the easy play to get in there and and cover some of the better hits do you see yourself at some point moving into original material uh you know the thing is we uh we are a cover band that's kind of what we do um and uh so we just kind of pick some of the best songs that we some of the songs we liked playing and some songs we've always wanted to play um and that you know that's pretty much it but we we do we do my songs so that's that's how we get into the original side of things we do stuff off of of, of my record um and um, and we'll hopefully do some stuff off my upcoming record um that's kind of how we get into that um we've never really sat down and tried to write or anything um and it's you know if that may happen in the future i don't know but right now i think it's a uh, it's it's the way things are going. It's it's working good. Now I know Nadja is there with you. Is she, are, are we able to talk to her? Are we able to say hello? If she's willing. Are are um, you willing? Yeah. yeah. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm willing. I, I'm because I'm curious. Uh, how is it for you to go on tour with sort of the guys and, and be part of this band? Because when I saw you in Montreal, and I'm trying to think when that was. I guess it was last year. Was it two or was it I this see. year? Right, whatever it was. Uh, no, it was last year. Last year, uh, I thought your presence on stage was absolutely essential. It just added, uh, I, I don't know, and I, and I mean this respectfully, but it added sort of a, a vaudeville kind of talent to it. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And and I don't mean that to be disrespectful. It just it added a layer. It bait for uh, what's it like for you to get out there and perform with with Dizzy? Yeah, it's kind of like um. Like for a slight second, I'll feel like, um, oh shit, I'm in the way of these guys doing their thing on stage. And then that kind of disappears. And then I just kind of just, yeah, I just do me and I go into my own world and, um, and yeah, and I'm just, yeah, in my own world, but I'm there with them. And then it seems to like be cool. Yeah, it is. (laughs) Uh, it, it's and I say this from the bottom of my heart. It is absolutely compelling to watch the entire band with all the moving pieces, and, and it's just anyway, it's a lot of fun. Uh, before I get back to Dizzy, though, how how long do you sort of want to keep doing this with the band? Is this something where you just do it because he's doing it, or is it like oh, I'll do it for a couple of years and then all right, I, I'm out? How how involved do you want to be? Um, you know, I haven't put a lot of thought into that. I'm kind of just a go with the flow kind of gal. And um, yeah, and I'll just keep going with the flow. Yeah. But everything feels great right now and everything's happy and uh, everyone seems, you know, cool with everything. And so, yeah, we'll just keep going how it's going. I'm going to have to drop a contract, I think. <laughs> That's right. You, you never know. Uh, but uh, speaking of contracts, uh, and I'll ask you this, Dizzy, because you've been with Guns N' Roses for 30 years and it's hard sometimes for people to wrap their head around that because you weren't part of the original five, but you sort of were 
the original six like a couple of years later. Um, what are some of your memories of that? W- were you expecting 30 years or was it just like, hey, I'll come and hang out and do this whatever 91, 92, 93 tour and it just never ended? You know, when you're when you're in your early 20s, as I was back then, I don't think in, and you're playing rock and roll music back then. We weren't I don't I wasn't thinking about what I was going to be doing 30 years from then. <laughs> you know, I, in, in my wildest imagination, I thought maybe I'd be, I don't know, retired living on an island somewhere or something. But um, I didn't really think about it. And um, but it, but that being said, I, I can't be more grateful and more thankful and happy that I've been able to do it for for this long and hope that I will continue to get to do it for as long as I possibly can, as long as we possibly can. So let's talk about that. You you had a solo album come out not too long ago. You are working on the next new solo record. Talk to me about that. As a solo artist, do you have some rules to follow or, or certain genre or musical style to follow? Or can the next album be, you know, a country album? Or can it be a pop album? Do you have any limitations and rules on what you're doing by yourself? You know, I think for the, for this record, I I uh, what I'm the only rule I'm, I have is eliminating any sort of rules, and uh, I really wanted to try to branch out a little bit more, <clears throat> and um, you know, touch on some other types of music and styles of music that I that I like and that I, that I'm you know I think have been involved with, and uh, so far it's turning out really cool. I think you know there's certain things glue it all together, um, I, so uh, I think you know the, the vocal stuff and and. Uh, there's a little bit more continuity, I suppose, but um, yeah, it's uh, definitely uh, reaching out and, and experimenting and, and trying some different things, and, and so far it's turning out really cool. Yeah, it really is. Now, I do want to ask you about this one sort of guest appearance you made years ago on the um, uh, Motorhead album called Hammered. Uh, talk to me a little bit about having actually having a, a – track with Lemmy and the guys and and what does it mean to sort of be involved as one of these sort of iconic bands they they might not have been selling out stadiums but yet when you say Motorhead it implies a certain something and fans go oh yeah Lemmy uh, just talk to me about that involvement and what it meant to you I you know it was one of those things I was sitting at home watching uh something on TV I don't remember and I, it was kind of it was later it's like nine o'clock in the evening and I got a, a phone call and I got, I can't remember who it was, but they asked me if I could come track some stuff for Motorhead. And I said, uh, yes, I'll drop what I'm doing and I'll come do that right now. Um, and I ended up going up to a house up in the Hollywood Hills and, and just, and laid it down with Lemmy. And it was, uh, then we, you know, we, we hung out in the, in the kitchen and drank some Jack for about two hours afterwards and just talked. And it was, you know, it was, it was a great experience and kind of a, it's kind of pinching myself, really, because it was, you know, one of those things you didn't really expect. It just come, came out of left field. But uh, it was great to be a part of that. And Lemmy was so cool, man. We, 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 he's very missed. Um, he definitely left his mark on music and certainly on, on, on this town. Um, so he's missed. But that was it was a great experience. I can't say I'm, I'm so lucky that things like that, you know, can happen. So let me ask you just a couple of, of Guns N' Roses questions. And I know that... Uh, it, it's best to just, uh, you know, watch the answers and stuff. But we do have this headline show coming up in uh, January for the uh, Bud Light Super Bowl Music Fest. Is, mm-hmm. is that one of many? Do, do you see the band gearing up for a whole run in 2020? Or is it we'll do a couple of off dates and then I'll go do Hookers and Blow and then we'll work on an album? And what do you sort of see going forward? Or is it just like, hey, when the phone rings, I'll just show up? You know, I, I hate to say it, but that's kind of how it works for me. You know, I'll get that email, I'll get that phone call, and uh, and I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, if I know that there's time off, then I will. That's when I schedule, you know, hookers and blow, and that's what I try to get some other things done. But when when the phone rings, when GNR calls, I I follow, I go. Yeah, how has that been for you musically over the years to 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 just be that guy uh, in terms of do you think that it has limited your playing where you should have been out there joining other bands and creating new music or are you like no i'm perfectly fine here i'm i'm cool with it because i do get a chance i do get opportunities to do other things and just being around those guys you know it's 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 a 
they work really, really hard. And that work ethic has definitely rubbed off on me. Um, just watching them over the years work in the studio um, and, you know, just and, and, and rehearsal and everything. It's, it's, uh, it's definitely put me in a good spot. And, and uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the way things are. And obviously in the last little run, the band has changed some of the songs. You've been bringing in some, some rarer pieces. How is that for you? Is that challenging in a negative sense? Like, oh, God, now we have to learn something. Or is it challenging in a very positive sense? Like, oh, good, little fresh paint, little fresh coat of paint for this set list. It'll be exciting. Does, does that does that sort of get you going when you change a song or two? No, no, I I dig it. I love adding adding new material. Um, it's a uh, um, it's it's good for us. I think it's it's really good for the fans. It's good for the people that come out to the shows that uh, to have some fresh material. You know, which well, fresh. You know, just to work up some older, cool, maybe more obscure songs, but. Um, yeah, it's it's a blast, actually. Yeah, it really is. Now, the uh, the album for uh, Hookers and Blow that's coming out in 2020, do you have a, a precise release date? Do you have a precise title for it? Is there is what can you share in terms of detail? Is there 12 songs or 15 songs? What's what's sort of the the story on the album? Um, there's a bunch of cool songs. <laughs> They'll be out soon. Uh, you know, so it's a uh, yeah, so we're going to get that all sorted out, and it'll be out really soon. Okay, so we're we're getting to it now. All right, let me ask you this then: Did you record like thirty songs, and then you're going to go through it and sort of pick the best twelve, or did you just say no? These are the twelve we're going or whatever. I mean, I'm, that's a random number, but yeah. right? But or did you just sort of <laughs> say? It doesn't, it doesn't, it's a good number. It's a good number, but no, we're we uh we're not that ambitious, man. We we picked out the songs we wanted to do, and we recorded them, and I think. Uh, you know, I'm not sure actually if all of them will make it, but we're oh, we're pretty close to having them all finished. And oh. plus, you know, we added some songs with Frankie too, some Zeppelin songs. So, okay, so that, so then I, I'm going to ask you this because I, I know Frankie plays the Led Zeppelin stuff in the pocket, perfect. Oh, it's, it's 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 amazing. It is it's such a pleasure to to listen to that, to track to that, to play with him. It's incredible. And you know, he played on my first record. He played on Rock and Roll Ain't Easy, the title song, and he played on Forgotten Cases. Um, and the reason that I, I really wanted to get him on there is because I wanted it to sound like Zeppelin. <laughs> I wanted that backbeat, and he delivers. He really does. It's really, really cool. Yeah, he does, so, and, and and he's flying off to Japan now to go do a – I think they're recreating the Nebworth 79 show or something like that, so he, he does it you know, straight on point, uh, but I'll ask you two questions about that. Does that suggest that the songs are faithful renditions of the originals? Or did you take some creative liberties and say, okay, let's play with these a little bit? That's the, you know, the thing about doing cover songs is that you have to find that fine line. You have to make it, I think, like, like yourself. Because if you're just going to try to sound like the, the original, you're probably not going to. Um, and that could be disappointing to a lot of people. Um, then again, if you, if you take too many liberties, then you piss people off. So, um, you try to find, you try to pay tribute to that song the best way you can. And that, and by representing certain things that are within that song. And it's, for me, it's been a kind of a treat to go through a lot of these songs and really, really pick them apart and, and, and listen to the little things that I think little nuances that need to be there. Um, so I might take a guitar thing. I might find a way to do it on a keyboard um, or, you know, or vice versa and, and just try to represent all the, the vocal arrangements and everything. So Zeppelin's, uh, I mean, they're, they were masters in the studio. And, uh, so it's, it's, and it, you know, another thing cool is it's, it's kind of like a learning experience too. So, um, I think we, we, on a lot of these songs, I think we found the right spot, you know, as far as, is our, our rendition, uh, it, it's, and, and paying tribute to, what's right and, and what we can do and what we can get away with. All right. So let me ask you this. When the fans pick up the album in, in 2020, are they going to be looking at 12 songs of artists that we know and go, Oh, there's a kiss song. There's an Aerosmith song. There's a whatever. I mean, other than the Led Zeppelin, cause you got Frankie there, or do you sort of dig down and say, Hey, let's go find some sort of rare gems that we've always found cool. And hopefully fans will find cool as well. I think there, it's a mixture of both. I think there's some songs that people are going to expect and there's some songs people aren't going to expect. And, and I think we might be turning some people on to some songs they may have never really been familiar with. And that was kind of our goal. Okay. And in terms of, of this, is this 
sort of one of many. Like you, you know, you've been around since what? Since uh, how long has it been? Fifteen years now? Twenty years? It's not like that. Yeah, a long time, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so first album in fifteen years. Is it okay? We finally did it, folks. Now get off our back, or is it like? Well, this was kind of fun. Maybe we'll do one for 2022. I, I got to be honest, going into that, you know, when we started doing this, that was kind of my my attitude was like, let's just get this over so people stop asking us to do a record. But somewhere along the line in the process of doing that, it, it started to become really enjoyable um, with Johnny Kelly on drums. And it's, you know, it's, he's incredible. And um, Robbie Crane played, or no, who's played bass? Scott Griffin played bass on on a, a lot of the songs. We have some other special guests. It became a really, really fun, and so um, I'm all up for doing another one. So we just get this one done first and out, and then we will, uh, we will, you know, maybe we'll tackle another one. That's kind of good. Now, in terms of uh, Robbie and Scott, uh, so Scott plays on the album, but but Robbie is still touring with you. So when people come out and see you at the uh, Mohegan Sun or whatever. Robbie Crane's going to... Um, well, Robbie is, is... He's stopped doing other things right now. So we have... Uh, Mike Duda is going to come back and, and join us for some of these upcoming shows. Um, he's out with Wasp right now, but he'll be back in time for the Mohican Sun, as well as the whiskey on the uh, the Christmas party at the Whiskey on the 26th, the day after Christmas. He'll be doing that too. So um, that's kind of how it works with Hookers and Blow. We have to... We have to... Because everyone has their day jobs. So whoever is available... I mean, it's a It's a big family. And uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, we love all, everybody that's done it and we uh, hope to keep, keep it going. Oh, there you go. And so if you ever need a, a replacement uh, bus driver, I, I will, I'll sign up. But I'll, I'll ask you this. Um, hey. I mean, why not, right? In, earlier in, in, in uh, November, uh, uh, Frankie Benelli sort of uh, conveyed or, or conferred in me the, the um, trusted me to, to, tell the world that he had this uh, stage four pancreatic cancer. And obviously uh, you knew and the band knew before. What was that like when you heard that news? Because personally for me, and then I'm seeing a lot of fans, it's, it's devastating. You, you just, you, you can't start wrapping your head around your heroes and your, your, your confreres that have this. Uh, what was that like for you? And the fact that even though he had this going on, he came to the studio and laid down drums for you. He didn't just lie in bed and say, forget it, I'm, I'm out. No, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's who he is. You know, that's, and when I first heard it, my first thought was he's going to, he's going to, he's going to put up a fight, man. You know, he's going to kick his ass. And, uh, I know he's, he's st still working on that. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, I have to say in some ways inspiring, you know, to, to go down to the studio and see him just, nail it i'm talking one take man it, he nailed it and uh and he he did it in 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 a condition that a lot of where a lot of us would probably still be just at home and and just you know in bed or whatever and he just he he nailed it and so yeah that's that was it's heavy he's and you know we're all pulling for him and and, and we love him man so yeah that's uh yep oh yeah we do listen uh and i'll just i'll just talk to to the fact of how tough he is i mean my back's been hurting and look i've been taking you know not going to shows going i'll just stay at home and and i mean it, it, listen i'm being a big baby about it he's dealing with cancer and he's out flying to japan to go play a three-hour led zeppelin set so yeah, that, yeah. God, the guy's a, a a fucking steel horse man he's 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 something to, to look up to um where where do we go from here? Not to transition uh, disrespectfully, but where do we go from here with with hookers and blow after the end of 2019 and the album comes out in 2020? What's next? Like, do, do, is it just sort of the same old, same old in terms in terms of the pattern of when there's free time, we'll play some shows and that's it, folks. That's how it goes. Um, I, you know, right now that's kind of it, and and there will be some shows. Um, maybe we should break up and get back together again, have a, a reunion <laughs> tour. We might do that again. We've done that a few times. But you got to wait four years. Oh, four, okay. oh, no, we can't wait that long. Yeah, no, we'll do it maybe four months. <laughs> maybe, I mean, actually, you know, we've, had, we've had a reunion breakup show before. We've broken up and then gotten back together in the same show. So we might do that again. Yeah, why not? Or you could storm off at one of these shows here at the uh, whatever uh, Mohegan Sun. Just storm off and then come back two hours later. <laughs> um yeah, we could we could but that's you know that that's a great venue up there man we it's we played there a few times and it's always good to go back there 
and uh, we're looking forward to that. So, um, but yeah, we, I probably won't storm off that show, uh, but maybe yeah, maybe one of the future shows maybe. Or maybe the whiskey one. Why not? But uh, okay. Uh, jokes aside, do do we see you coming back to Canada? Because you did that run with uh, Dead Daisies. They, of course, now went and hired Glenn Hughes, which is kind of cool. Do do you see yourself going out on the road? Uh, you know, more sort of internationally at any point, or is this really just driving around in a van in the states? Um, man, we're always always stoked to come up to Canada. I mean, and. Uh, you know, with, with, with whoever, it's always great to come up there and play. So, um, it's, it's always one of our goals and I'm sure that we will get some days up there as soon as we can. And, uh, um, it's great to come up there in the wintertime because it's so effing cold that people are just, yeah, I think people are grateful that we're there sometimes. And, uh, I see people walking around with t-shirts and stuff. That's, that's pretty amazing. You guys are very hardy. I got to say. We are. And, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Mustaine of Megadeth made that observation years ago. Cause they always sort of play here like in January and February. And he said, yeah. well, and he said to me, he said, well, there's nobody in the market. There's no competition. There's nobody right. vying for our ticket. And it's just like, Absolutely true. It's like, well, yeah, you got a point in, in the summer. You've got so much choice that you got to sort of say, well, I can't do Dizzy Reed. So I'm going to do Megadeth or vice versa in the winter. It's like, no, there's nobody else here. I guess we'll go, you know? <laughs> right? it's, yeah, it's better if they don't have a choice. <laughs> well, it sort of is, right? Um, and then I'll, I'll ask you this, uh, and I know I, 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 boy, I know you don't like the Guns N' Roses questions, but just how is sort of the, the atmosphere on the tour and all that? It, it just seems as though everybody is just getting along and we're just back to where it should have always been. Um, it's, it, everything's going good, man you know, knocking wood and all that, but it's, uh, it's been very enjoyable, um, for me. And, um, it's, you know, when we're on stage together, it's, it's, it's pretty effing cool. It's a great feeling. And I, I can, I'm pretty sure it transcends into, into the audience. And I think, uh, I hope we just keep it going, man. I really do. Well, listen, like I said, uh, I saw three shows on this, this reunion tour, whatever you want to call it. And they were spectacular. I mean, the, the Montreal show, the Ottawa show and the Toronto shows were just uh, spectacular and and Richard Fortas. I don't I don't think people give him enough credit. He he is just a monster player and he just he's he's just fun to watch. So he's, yeah, Richard's top of the heat, man, and he's 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 probably the most versatile guitar player. I you know, I first time musician I think probably that I I know. Um, he can go from psychedelic furs to to Welcome to the Jungle with no problem. So got to give him credit, right? He can do it all, and he does it all very well. He works really hard too, man. So it's uh, it's uh, and it you know it works. It, it it everything sort of gels together, and you know we've got Frank on drums, who's amazing, and Melissa is also incredible. So it's it's a uh, it's a blast, man. It is, and and I will finish on the million dollar question, which I'm I know you probably won't answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Is there any new music from Guns N' Roses in 2020? Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least you didn't say, "Hey, Mitch, it's been nice talking to you." Go ahead. No. Sorry. Yeah, no. But but do you th- maybe perhaps one song? Oh, can I can't say maybe. All right, I'll, I'll go with maybe. Well, we're 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 eagerly anticipating it, so hopefully it'll happen. And uh, as a, as always, uh, always a pleasure, toujours un plaisir. Uh, I look forward to uh, more hookers and blow. You know, somebody could probably cut that out of the tape and and make me feel <laughs> real bad. But anyway, uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's going to be a very bad drop to have rope floating around the internet. But uh, yeah, always always looking forward to it. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Always happy to support and uh, you know bring bring this thing to Canada. Let's 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 see some some hookers and blow up in Canada. Man, you got it, Mitch. We'll be up there soon. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure. Merci. All right, peace. This has been Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. For more exclusive content and interviews, subscribe on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, and many more. Follow Mitch on all the socials, especially Twitter, at Mitch LaFon, and on Instagram, at Mitch underscore LaFon. Get your Mitch merch now at loudtracks.com slash Mitch.